Good morning and welcome to the Vina Capital Vietnam Opportunity Fund Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted any time by the Q&A tab situated in the right hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received in the meeting itself. However, the company can review all the questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Tom Ha. Good afternoon. Good afternoon from Ho Chi Minh City. Welcome to the Vietnam Capital Vietnam Opportunity Fund Q1 webinar. Uh, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm joined here with Andy Ho, the Chief Investment Officer of Vina Capital and the Lead Portfolio Manager of the strategy. Alongside him is Khan Vu, a Co-Portfolio Manager of the fund. Our fund is a $1.2 billion uh, London-listed FTSE 250 investment company. Uh, it's been around for over 20 years, focusing both on the public and the private uh, investment opportunities within Vietnam. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to say thank you to the team at Investor Meet Company for having us on the platform. And I encourage the audience to participate in the Q&A session uh, after our short presentation. So today, uh, I'd like to focus on three main areas. One is to get an update on the macroeconomic activity uh, in Vietnam uh, since we have just wrapped up Q1. And two, uh, get an update on the portfolio and the strategy. And three is to share our outlook for Q2 and beyond. So Andy, turning over to you first. Uh, beginning of the year, we started with few uh, key assumptions. One is a strong recovery in manufacturing. Uh, two is a modest recovery in consumer spending coupled with uh, re continued rebounding in tourism. And three is the uh, government's continued focus on uh, public spending. So that accumulated in uh, our forecast, GDP forecast for the year at 6.5. So Andy, uh, where are we at right now? Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Thanks for that. In uh, Q1 of 2024, we landed uh, at about 5.7% in terms of GDP growth. Uh, one could argue that it was lower than Q4 of 2023, uh, but if we look at over the last uh, five years, it's one of the best uh, Q1 quarter uh, that we've had over the last five years. And it's uh, you know based on the factors that you mentioned earlier, uh, more orders coming in from uh, abroad. So Vietnam's manufacturing base was very strong uh, during uh, Q1. And in fact, we exported more than we manufactured in other words, we started to sell into the inventory um, that Vietnam built up over the last 12 to 18 months. And second, tourism did uh, come back uh, with, with vengeance, if, 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 if I may. Um, the number of tourists uh, uh, outside of Chinese tourists uh, came back quite significant. And that was a, a big win for Vietnam, particularly over the Lunar New Year period. And third, we did see the government continuing to spend on, on, on public spending and public uh, on infrastructure spending. We're seeing quite a bit of that. And uh, we hope for the rest of the year, we will be on a trajectory to deliver about 65 uh, to 7% uh, GDP growth. Now, GDP growth in Vietnam, if you break it down by quarter, there is a seasonal impact where typically the first uh, couple of quarters tend to be slower than the latter couple of quarters. Right. Very interesting. Uh, I mean, if we go to the airports right now, the airports are packed. And, and obviously, uh, one of the, the focus for the government right now is to build the new uh, international airport within Ho Chi Minh City to, to facilitate. Yeah, and in process. fact, Tom, if you fly into um, Saigon now, you can look out the window and you can actually still, you can see now that clearing of the land. And I believe, you know, they're expecting that the airports will be operational in the next few years, perhaps 27, 28. Um, and that will really um, increase the capacity of, um, of, of, of tourism here in, in Saigon. Sorry, come go back yeah. to you, Andy. Yeah, um, I mean, Andy, maybe we can talk a little about real estate. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a big uh, part of the index as well as contributes 8 to 10 percent of the, to the GDP. Um, we've had a lot of uh, headwinds last year. Uh, can, can you maybe share lights if, if, if we are seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel? You could argue that globally, real estate has had headwinds over the last one, two, or three years. In Vietnam, we are in a situation where, one, the interest rates level from a term deposit to lending side is very low, low uh, historically very low. 
So the government wants to encourage uh, people to borrow, uh, businesses to borrow, uh, people to borrow to buy homes, businesses to borrow to expand capacity. So we're seeing that side of the equation uh, being very positive. The second component is that the government has implemented new regulations and rules uh, um, to, to help the real estate development side move along. And right now we have a new set of laws or the revised set of laws that should come uh, into effectiveness uh, January 1 of 2025. But there's a lot of discussions that perhaps we can accelerate that um, effectiveness to, to somewhere middle of 2024. Now, the key here is that the new rules and regulations, one of the key components that will drive uh, the demand for real estate is that it will allow uh, Vietnamese who are uh, living abroad um, or overseas Vietnamese, if you will, that can prove to have some sort of root and ties to Vietnam, they will then be qualified to purchase real estate as if they are a domestic uh, investor. So that's, that's, that's a key uh, component for the and demand side. Just to clarify, I mean, are, are foreign investors or Vietnamese for living abroad, are they currently able to, to buy or has that been a yes, problem? Yes, that is a good question. Overseas Vietnamese are deemed to be foreigners. Right. They can buy, but they are purchasing real estates under more or less the foreign ownership law, which means that they can buy for up to 50 years uh, as a lease. And each project is limited to roughly 30% of the capacity being available to foreign purchases. So it's very limited. Uh, with the new law, it becomes more or less uh, uh, much easier for uh, Vietnamese uh, living abroad or even born abroad to participate in the real estate market in uh, Vietnam. I, I'm going to say, you know, already this news obviously is spreading abroad because, you know, I'm getting friends from Australia, family from Australia, even the UK going, hey, you know, how do we buy real estate uh, in Vietnam? These are Vietnamese or, or foreigners. So, now, don't get yeah, me wrong. Yeah. They have been purchasing yeah. real estate in the past. Mm. But my suspicion is that they've been using friends and families in mm. Vietnam to be their nominees. So now it's broadened the, uh, the, 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 the group of people that would want to purchase. And, you know, previously, a small group of people would purchase but through nominees. But now a much broader folks, uh, set of people can buy and they can buy uh, more, 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 more comfortably uh, in the real estate market. Now, having said that, what we are seeing right now is the activity in Hanoi, more specifically, uh, ramping up significantly. We're seeing a lot of liquidity uh, in the real estate space, particularly in... Uh, and is that residential or, or industrial? It's primarily in residential. In other words, people are buying up apartments, uh, homes, when they become available. Uh, the, the, the challenge is that the inventory uh, available is very limited, and so therefore prices are going up quite rapidly. We are thinking that over the next few weeks, the wave of demand will shift uh, to the south in Ho Chi Minh City or, or Saigon. But again, the inventory level uh, available is very, very limited. Now, if you heard Mike, uh, chief economist, talk earlier, he did present the case that Vietnam's inventory level of real estate is, is much lower right. than demand. We do need more homes for the mid to low income earners, uh, as opposed to uh, China where there's uh, oversupply of homes. In Vietnam, we have an undersupply of homes. So whatever we can manufacture, produce, or build in a low to mid income level is getting absorbed quite rapidly. Got it, okay, so just to sum it up, this is probably a good time to, to, to uh, revisit and maybe I should buy an apartment or a house <laughs> soon, right? There you, you go, there you go. Excellent. So. Uh, so we've talked about the economy improving, uh, manufacturing and export is, is improving, uh, real estate uh, sentiment is also improving, and obviously the stock market. So Khan, maybe we can turn over to the stock market. Uh, it's one of the, the best, or if not the second best, I think, performing uh, market in, in Asia. So, and can you share a little, uh, sh shed some light on, on that? Yeah, I think, Tom, you know, looking at the market performance, you've got to overlay that with uh, this interest rate environment. And then, as Andy mentioned, we have seen interest rates come down quite rapidly and quite significantly over the past 12 months. You know, Vietnam policy rates, um, deposit rates, they've come down uh, by about 500 basis points over the past 12 months. And that's meant that um, depositors who have held the, their money in term deposits, six months, 12 months, now that those deposits are maturing, they've got to find other means to invest. Yes. 
and uh, the stock market is clearly one of those options. And you've seen that uh, the first quarter this year, for example, the, um, the Vietnam index is up about 11% um, in dollar terms. Um, and that's after a very you know, respectable performance last year. And within, you know, while, while there has been a little bit of volatility in recent days, perhaps some profit taking, um, as you've heard a little earlier, the long term, the structural outlook, the terms of growth, where the economy is heading, um, supports uh, the, the, the outlook for the, the stock market. Um, the, uh, the catalysts, things like the new laws on real estate, um, the increased public spending, um, the lower rate environment, these are again things that are supporting the, environment, uh, the, the stock market. Within that, I think it's very important to highlight that liquidity is up. In fact, liquidity is up to over uh, levels where we've seen two years ago. Right? So today, average daily trading um, volume values are about 1.3 billion US dollars. If you think about not too long ago, pre-COVID, we were doing about 250 million US dollars in average daily. So today, you know, that's a significant level of participation. And for us, what we see that, it, it's a sign of confidence, that investors are confident to step into that market. They're, they're confident to take that money out of other dormant forms of investment. Uh, safe, yes, admittedly, but returns are lower and they're putting it into the stock market. So overall, um, the market this year, calendar year today, one of the best performing in the region um, and the outlook for this year, if you hear uh, from Mike and Ling uh, from our research, again, the, 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 the foundations for that performance this year remain quite resilient. I think you, you probably need to um, you know, uh, tell the audience that the, the, there is capital restriction in Vietnam. Okay. So uh, investors in Vietnam are uh, limited to a number of assets, one of which is the stock market, uh, real estate being the other asset, and we touch upon that, and then gold. So really, the capital uh, uh, cycles amongst these three assets, and right now, with low interest rate environment, they are attract. They're, they're very attracted to uh, stock market, with volumes going up significantly, followed by real estate, uh, and and gold prices continuing to go up is also a very attractive asset. I mean, could, could, perhaps could we segue to that because obviously gold prices are you know record high levels, likewise here in Vietnam. And what's the dynamic that's driving some of that? The gold I, I think Vietnam is 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 not a price leader in gold. Uh, you know, gold prices globally has gone up to record level. It's just that a lot of Vietnamese people love to hold on to gold. They simply buy gold, physically hold them. And, and as prices go up, you, you, you can imagine that the gold becomes even more attractive. It's, it's like the older generation telling the younger generation, you know, I told you so, right? So they're the ones who primarily invest in gold and the younger generations want to invest in stocks and real estate. But then when the gold prices go up, you know, they, have the, uh, they can say, I told you so. And so now there's more excitement to participate in the gold market as well. Got it. Well, uh, you know, the market has rallied up. Uh, maybe you guys can share uh, with the audience, have they missed the rally? Is, are they too late? I mean, in different, ask, asking differently, why should they be, still be excited about the opportunity? Yeah, I, I think that that's really the question, right? That do you believe in the long-term structural story here in Vietnam? And much of that is, is based around, one, the demographics, two, um, the economy and the manufacturing. And, and those elements still are very much in place. Um, you know, we're a country of 100 million people, 65% are under 35 years of age. You can imagine um, that rising middle income class. Um, and you can see that um, as uh, FDI money comes into the country, that, um, that's going to create jobs, that's going to uh, create a, a level of urbanization away from the country into the cities, and there's going to be demand for things like housing, banking services, education, healthcare. Those are the sectors that we very much focus on. And later when we cover our strategy, um, we can talk a little bit about how we take advantage of that opportunity. And, and so, no, investors have not missed out on it, but it's certainly in a, in a time now that um, they should very much consider Vietnam. And, I, and we, we suspect that um, with that rising level of tourism, and tourism is back over to pre-COVID levels um, for many countries and visitors, that we're going to see some of that translate to a conversion into 
what about investing into Vietnam? Right. If you talk to some of the analysts, whether they're buy side analysts or sell side analysts, you'll see that uh, you know most of these analysts are projecting an earnings growth potential in 2024 of anywhere between 10 to 20 percent. So we have uh, potentially a pretty strong uh, growth uh, for 2024, and I hope 2025 and 26 as well. But it is a market where you do have to take a long-term view, and it will be volatile in the short term. And we hope that the the, the, the risk-adjusted return is, is, is appropriate. Right. I mean, uh, and that is exactly what the, your, your, the fund strategy is, right? So maybe we can segue to the portfolio. Andy, do you mind maybe sharing with the audience uh, the investment philosophy of the fund and, and, the, and the strategy? Yeah, the, the fund primarily look, uh, looks, after, uh, looks to invest in good businesses in sectors that benefit or contribute to the growth of the domestic economy. But as we deployed uh, uh, money, we deploy you know, roughly 40, 50, 60 million dollars uh, through private equity means. In other words, we will look at a business, and whether they're listed or they're private, we look at a business and we say, look, we would like to participate in their growth story. We like to back the management team. We like the management team. We trust the management team, and we'll negotiate terms of investment into the business. We'll have due diligence rights and will participate at the board level or at a managerial level to help grow the business. And over the next three, five, or seven years, we hope to take the business onto the stock market through an IPO and continue to hold on to them because they continue to grow, or we can take them through a trade sales. We've had many, many trade sales over the last 15, 20 years. I think we average around two to three a year, and that's a great way for us to exit. At the end of the day, we manage a fund, and that fund success is highly depend dependent upon the ability for us to exit some of these investments that we've made, and I think we've demonstrated that uh, over the years. So in short, our strategy is to look for great management teams in sectors that contribute to, to the growth of the domestic economy, and we want to help them grow the business to the next level. So, so Andy, um, talking about the, the companies that, that you, you like to invest in, can you give us a few examples of, of maybe favorite companies that, you've, that illustrate that, that strategy? All of the companies are my favorite company. But if you're asking, let me give you an illustration of, um, we choose a company with good management team. For example, TCI. TCI is a hospital platform in the north. The, 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 the irony of TCI is it's not run by a doctor. It's actually run by a very strong businesswoman. And she knows her, obviously she knows her healthcare profession very well. She hires doctors, nurses, buys medicine, builds the infrastructure. She also is able to navigate the sales and marketing world to ensure that revenue comes into the hospital. And she's also able to navigate the regulatory process to get approvals for certain services, license, etc. So we have backed a very strong woman who I believe is a very good leader in managing this hospital platform. And we will help her buy more hospitals to, to, to expand the, 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 the platform uh, in Hanoi. That's an example of backing a good management team. And you know, we don't see many hospitals being listed in Vietnam, so how would you exit such? Uh, you know, that's a great question. There is one hospital listed in Vietnam, and that's right, there's not many. Um, historically, our experience indicate that uh, exits to hospitals tend to be through trade sales. We've had two major trade sales in Vietnam, not us, but others, uh, both of which have gone to uh, Singaporean investors. And we, help, we hope that sets the benchmark in terms of multiple valuation multiples uh, for our exits in the next one to two years. So in short, it is typically through trade sales that we would exit some of these ha hospital platforms. I mean, with the continued interest in FDI in Vietnam, I, I think it's easier and easier to find yeah. uh, buyers, yeah. right? Yeah, FDI is certainly, um, like Khan said, you know, folks that come to Vietnam, invest in Vietnam, open up a factory, um, create value through jobs, creation, etc. There'll be a need for hospital as well as education and other uh, products and services in the economy. And so, yes, it would create an environment where the demand for healthcare goes up, and as a result, uh, making it very uh, interesting target for uh, acquisitions uh, through st by strategic uh, investors. Got it. Yeah, and I think in general, you know, when we look at companies in the portfolio, and you can see on this this slide here, you know, if you look at companies like FPT, 
They're the leading technology service provider in the country. Um, ACB, one of the best uh, commercial uh, banks in the country. P&J, the number one jeweler. Um, TCI, as Andy mentioned, the number one um, pri private hospital in Hanoi. Kang Dian, uh, the leading landed real estate developer in the south here. Ankun Woodworking, a private equity investment that subsequently has listed. They're the number one uh, laminate producer in, in the country. We're looking for quality businesses. We're looking for businesses that sort of lead their segments or we can help them grow to be leaders in that segment. And over the years, we've invested into over 200 businesses. Many of these businesses we've invested in when they were private, where we can get in and do the, the private equity, the active roles that, that Angie mentioned in, in terms of our strategy. And as these companies mature, and as we um, grow with these companies, we can either take a two paths of exit, right? They can list, go on to the stock exchange and list, and if we can hold on to them or we can sell them when they're listed. Or two, as we've done in many times, take them through a trade sale, through an M&A process, sell uh, these companies. And if you're a foreign company in the region or an FDI investor, you know, sometimes you want to come to Vietnam and you say, well, I don't want to spend one, two, three, five years building out. I'd rather identify top companies in the segment and acquire them. And Andy, you know, we did that recently, right? We exited one of the leading um, PET packaging and ma manufacturing companies recently. You maybe want to share, share some of that, that story and that, that strategy, that exit. Sure, we, 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 uh, we invested in a company called uh, Ngoc Nghia. Mm. It's one of the, larger, um, or the largest PET bottling company in Vietnam. Uh, the, uh, the strategic buyer was uh, Indorama. They came in rather than build organically in Vietnam, they chose the acquisition routes. And we were fortunate to uh, have had time to restructure the balance sheet, restructure the manufacturing equipment uh, and, and the machinery and equipment, and then uh, be able to put in a strong management team, making the asset quite attractive to Indorama. Okay, maybe we can turn over to the portfolio and then the performance. Uh, Khan, do you want to share a little bit about how, how has the fund fared uh, versus the, the index and, and, and maybe the, the construction of the portfolio? Great, yeah. So, you know, as we said earlier, your markets performed well, but our strategy is both private and public. So we have opportunities in both the public equities as well as private equity. And today, about 70% of the portfolio is in public equity and the balance is in private equity. Uh, over the past one, three, and five years, the fund has delivered outperformance to the Vietnam Index. Now, that's not a benchmark for us, but it's a useful reference point for investors. So if you, can th if you, if you look over the, the past 12 months um, rolling basis up to the end of March, um, the fund itself is up 21%. Right? The index over that period is up 16%. And if you take that further out to three and five years, and on a five-year basis, um, the fund is up almost 60%, while the index is up 33%. So that strategy of both private and public still allows us to deliver very strong performance for our investors. The more important um, element of performance, at least for our strategy, we think, is around this idea of volatility. Because you can see in the earlier discussion that the market is volatile. However, by having that one quality companies, um, those that are resilient in you know, different cycles of economic um, growth, and two, having that balance of private and public, we're able to deliver that top performance at the lowest level of volatility. And this is you know, one of our favorite slides here. And if you just follow us through on this one, it shows the um, returns you know, on that vertical axis, but on the horizontal axis, I think it's really important, is that you want to be investing in something that delivers you lower levels of volatility. I mean, unless you love roller coaster rides, <laughs> there's a theme park for that. But here, when you invest in Vietnam, we believe that having low levels of volatility while delivering high performance is perhaps what investors are looking for. Okay. And is there a golden rule where you, you try to have X percentage of private equity to maintain that level, uh, low level volatility? Yeah, we, we, we try, um, we, we spend 80% of our time 
deploying money into what we call private equity investments. And over time, months and years, a lot of the what we call private equity investments will migrate into cash to trade sales or onto the stock market. So uh, we would try to populate that bucket, but that bucket uh, gets reduced because companies move out through cash or through uh, listed. Um, but what we like to do is push it to a roughly a 25% level. Uh, but uh, over time, we find that it's relatively, it, it, it's a fortunate thing to have. It's difficult to get there because we are able to move some of these businesses through trade sales and through IPO. So, so maybe we can dive deeper into portfolio. Uh, Khan, anything new that you'd like to update on, on the portfolio? Question? Sure. So the portfolio today, if you look at the top three sectors, uh, real estate um, is the number one sector at 23%, financials at 22%, and materials is about 13%. And over the past uh, 12 months um, or so, what we have been doing is really consolidating um, the public equities portfolio. Today, there are about 15 holdings in that portfolio, and the top holdings have been long-term holdings in this portfolio. Asia Commercial Bank, we mentioned earlier, one of the top uh, commercial banks in the country, that represents about 14% of the portfolio. Kangdian Homes, that landed developer we talked about earlier, that's about 10%. And Huafat used to be the number one um, holding in the portfolio. It's the leading steel company in the country. Um, over the past two years, we have actually been trimming that position and selling it to strength. It still represents about 9%. What's up and coming and, and rising the portfolio is FPT Corporation, that technology company, the, the, one of the few technology companies that are listed in Vietnam, very successful. It's about 60% of its, its revenues are derived from software outsourcing. Um, they, they go to Japan and the US um, to work with companies there and help with software outsourcing. Think of a Tata or Infosys of India. That's what FPT is, is here in Vietnam. That is a stock that's been formed very well in the past 12 months off the back of the level of interest in uh, the technology space, specifically AI and semiconductors. But remember, at its core, FPT's business is, is still very much built around software outsourcing. Um, so those positions have remained very stable. Um, on the private equity side, um, there's some, been some movements. One, um, we've, we've, done the consolid we've done a roll-up of um, the hospital platform and bolted on and built out some investments in the hospital platform. Andy mentioned earlier about Tukup Medical, that number one private health hospital in the north. That's today the largest private equity holding the portfolio. Very close to that is the second largest hospital platform in the portfolio, Dumdri Medical. And basically across those two hospital platforms, we're covering healthcare, we deliver you know, private healthcare from the north all the way down to the south into the Mekong Delta. Um, and so healthcare is really an important part of our portfolio. And in fact, if you look at the healthcare as a percentage of the index, it's much lower than the eight, nine percent in our portfolio. Um, other investments um, that have changed is that in holdings um, is the convention business that we've invested in. I mean, Andy, in the past uh, 12 months, we, we've actually uh, done, done a roll up and an expansion in that strategy. Maybe you want to talk about that briefly. Yeah, so over the last 12 months, we have helped uh, in uh, holdings uh, acquire a uh, set of restaurants, uh, roughly 40 or so restaurants with about 15 brands in that portfolio. They want to expand the hospitality uh, space. They were very strong in delivering um, services in the convention center for weddings and corporate events. And they wanted to expand into the restaurants and uh, F&B business. So we helped them uh, expand that business over the last uh, 12 months. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy uh, exercise. It is quite challenging, uh, but we believe the upside potential is tremendous simply because we have a lot of people in Vietnam uh, that are getting wealthier and wealthier, and they're going to want to spend money on eating out and eating at places that they recognize the brand, the quality, and the consistency. And so those are the key important factors that we're helping, we're helping in holdings expand their business uh, into. Uh, I also want to just mention uh, what you said earlier. I, I want to make sure that the audience, I want to share with the audience that our strategy in terms of BOF is independent of the, uh, the VN index. Now, we are not benchmarked against the VN index. We will uh, choose uh, the sectors that we think have the highest or the best risk-adjusted return. 
and as a result, then choose companies within each of these sectors to uh, invest in. So we are agnostic to the benchmark or the Vietnam index. Uh, a lot of people ask, but at the end of the day, o over the long term, three to five years, uh, we will have to deliver uh, returns that above and uh, that are above and beyond the uh, the Vietnam index. And fortunately, we have, and we'll continue that strategy over the next five to ten years as well. So, what kind of sectors are you looking at right now? Maybe you can share a little bit. Should yeah, on the pipeline. Uh, happy to do that. Um, you know, as we construct our portfolio or as we revisit our portfolio every six months, we look at the sectors that we have exposure to. What we do is we look at the risk-adjusted return for each of the sectors. We basically look at the earnings potential for each of these sectors against the risk that they, uh, they're exposed to. And right now, we do feel very strongly about the financials and the real estate market. It is, um, you know, in Asia, real estate is a key pillar to the wealth of individuals, the wealth of businesses, and banks is, 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 is very pervasive. They participate in all segments of the economy, and banks is a, a very strong sector uh, for growth um, in Vietnam. But as, as infrastructures get built out, uh, residential buildings and office buildings get built up, we need to, uh, the businesses, the, the constructions need to buy materials. So we're very, we're very positive on the material space, particularly in the steel uh, sector. And in t on top of that, uh, as people get wealthier and wealthier, they're going to spend money. So we call that consumer discretionary, consumer spending. So we'll participate in that sector as well. Although the competition in that space is quite tremendous, we think that it has a tremendous upside because people are spending more money. So those are the areas that we're participating in. Uh, healthcare as well. Healthcare, we are a nation that is getting older uh, and wealthier. And as you get older and wealthier, you want to spend money on good quality healthcare. And that's what our healthcare platform from the north to the south uh, is delivering to the, to, the, to, the, to the people of Vietnam. So it seems like everything is rosy. Uh, obviously, there are some bumps along the ways. But maybe you can share with the audience what are the risks that keep, keeps you up at night? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> my, my view is that I, I always keep three top risks in the back of my pocket and, and uh, keep an eye on it. Um, one of the key risks uh, at the moment that we uh, have to face is the FX risks. We, we do report in US dollars. We trade in uh, uh, pounds in the UK, but we invest in the local currency, the VND. Um, with a very strong US dollars at 105, 106, 107, you can imagine that the local currency is weakening, and that has an impact on the value of the investments that we make. Not only us, but also um, the value of businesses that export and import uh, in Vietnam. So FX is a risk that we are a challenge with right now, and we're looking at it. Uh, the, the second risk we face is, uh, as businesses grow, they find it very difficult to recruit talent and, main, and, and retain talent because the competition, the growth of the economy is very strong, and, and, and these folks are getting recruited left and right. And, and that can, you can imagine that causes an inflationary effect on labor costs. The third component that we need to keep an eye on is that everyone tells me, and everyone, we, we, we do admit that it is a challenge, and that is the anti-corruption campaign that Vietnam has embarked on. It's a, it could be at times a bit disruptive. It could be at times a bit smoother. But I have to admit, it is happening, but it's happening because I believe that um, Vietnam is a country that is operating, uh, wants to operate in a set of laws, and people who break that set of laws will, will be responsible for it, and that's the process we'll go through. And in the medium to longer term, we will have a higher quality uh, participants in the market uh, because they will adhere to a set of laws that the government have implemented. So, to me, those are the three risks that we sort of face at the moment. And hopefully over the next six to 12 months, it'll be different. Okay. And, you know, I keep an eye on those, the three cycles, right? I mean, there's one, that policy cycle, two, the business cycle, and three, the sentiment cycle. And what we mean is, you know, the policy cycle meaning rate environment. We've seen that the rate environment is accommodative. It's, it's, we've seen interest rates reduce that's going to be pro-growth. Two, um, the government has uh, putting, in, putting in laws and regulations that will support that growth. So the other cycle is the business cycle. And you've heard today that um, there are strong pockets of growth for 2024. EPS for the market, um, the consensus is anywhere between 10 and 20%. We're still early in the year, but certainly it's in the right direction. 
um, and the consumer sentiment is, is, is recovering, exports are, are recovering, so the business cycle looks positive. And I think the third element is, is that sentiment cycle. What are investors feeling? And really the test there is the liquidity um, and participation in the market. Domestic investors still make up about 90% of investors in the market. They're really participating in the market now. And, and so those three cycles that are in almost synchrony, synchrony synchronicity, <laughs> whatever the word is, but the important thing is, is that they're, they're working together in the right direction. And for us, that gives us some comfort that 2024 and beyond, um, will, you know, Vietnam will look to, to be a very strong performer in the region. Synchronized. Thank you. <laughs> Synchronized. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank, you. thank you, guys, for, for sharing. Maybe we, if we can close with the last comments, why should the audience buy VOF? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, <clears throat> Tim Cook is here. Right? We wish him a great visit to Vietnam. Um, but really, it's a reflection of the Vietnam story. It's a reflection of manufacturing, FDI, uh, more investors globally being interested in Vietnam. We're seeing a lot of manufacturing bases set up shops in Vietnam, from Intel to the suppliers of Apple to Legos, etc. And this is the excitement for Vietnam over the next five to 10 years. Because when the factories, when the money comes in to build the factories, People will get jobs. Uh, they will become wealthier and wealthier. They're going to spend money. They're going to spend money on food and services, cars, um, electricities, etc. And so that provides a foundation for our investment thesis over the next five to ten years. And we're looking at businesses that can grow anywhere between 15 to 25 percent uh, per annum over the next uh, five to ten years. And that's the excitement of investing in Vietnam. At the end of the day, we need to find businesses that are roughly below $500 million in value, and over the next three to five years after we invest, go above $1 billion in value, we exit through an IPO or trade sales, and we're happy, and we take that, that, that proceeds and we reinvest again with the, for the growth of the economy. All right, so uh, thank you for, for your presentation remarks. Uh, just, just, just as a reminder, there's a Q&A session after this, so please submit your questions if you haven't done so. Thank you. Perfect. Andy, Khan, Tom, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments through those questions that have been submitted today, I'd like to remind you that the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And Tom, if I could just hand over to you just to read out the questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so, I'll pick up from you at the end. Uh, thanks, Alessandro. Uh, so while we wait for the audience to uh, type in the questions, maybe we can start with a, a one that was pre-submitted. Uh, so the question always comes up uh, every now and then about the EM upgrade. So Andy, Khan, uh, any updates on that? Yeah, at the moment, um, Vietnam is poised to move from the frontier market to the emerging market on the FTSE Russell uh, standards. And then hopefully uh, after that, the, uh, you, uh, under the MSCI um, you know, frontier to the MSCI emerging uh, market. Um, so, so I think right now we're in the probationary lists uh, for the FTSE Russell, and hopefully in 2025, we will be able to migrate to EM. But what's important here is once we migrate to uh, EM, there'll be a lot more uh, investors, funds, whether they're ETF or active managers, interested in Vietnam because uh, Vietnam will become part of a benchmark for them to compare against. And so we hope that uh, by migrating to emerging market, we'll have a lot more interest uh, in Vietnam. But we do recognize that uh, investors in the frontier market will be begin to exit their position in Vietnam, and then emerging market investors will, will pick up. And we hope that the pickup will be significantly more uh, than the divestment on the frontier side. So what would be a typical expected flows if we get upgraded? I think for the uh, FTSE Russell, you have to understand, right now we are one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, component of the frontier market. Yeah. So once we migrate to emerging market, those that participate in the frontier market will have to exit Vietnam. But once we enter the emerging market, we are a very small component of a larger uh, portfolio or, or basket. 
And as a result, we will pick up investors in the emerging market. We think that the volume of pickup, in, especially in the FTSE Russell, would be roughly five to seven times because that's the size uh, of the emerging market relative to the frontier. But remember, we're going to be a very smaller component of that bigger basket. Whereas in the MSCI, we do expect the size of the participant to be over 100 times uh, the emerging market relative to frontier market. And as a result, uh, there should be a material increase in interest once we move from the MSCI frontier to emerging market frontier, right. uh, and, emerging and, market. Frontier. And these are just, just passive, right? We, what we showed right now are just the passive flows, but we, we see a lot of active managers that will eventually be able to invest in, in, in Vietnam sure, once sure, we upgrade. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Right. Um, there is also a question on uh, Saigon Commercial Bank. Um, I, I think that is expected because, uh, just to give a little background, so there's a lot of head, uh, headlines about the, the trial of Madame Lan uh, who has essentially defrauded uh, the bank of uh, billions of dollars, and she was essentially sentenced to death for financial crime. Uh, so maybe can you talk about, is that factored in already into the market? Is, is this a systemic uh, issue? And maybe you can talk in terms of context of uh, VOF's unique uh, investment approach and how we can actually avoid these type of situations. Sure, I think the impact of the arrest of Madame Lan and the impact of Saigon Commercial Bank has an impact in really three areas. One is the commercial bank sector. Yes, that has a significant impact, and uh, fortunately, the State Bank of Vietnam has stepped up and provided sufficient liquidity uh, to prevent any sort of bank run. And this happened, I think, around Q4 of 2022 already. So that, that has gone by. In terms of affecting the capital market, uh, we have seen very little impact on the capital market itself. Um, and so uh, we've been very, the market has been very fortunate to that end. Uh, on Vina Capital and VOF, we have not participated. We did not invest in any businesses associated with Madame Lan. Uh, we did not invest in Saigon Commercial Bank. So we are, we are not affected by this uh, scandal. Right. But also your investment terms, right, if it protects you, right, in terms of if there was something to happen, we have rights to to exit these deals? Yeah, typically we do ask for some sort of uh, exit uh, path, like a put option, uh, what have you, if, there's are, if there are cases where the sponsor um, uh, is entangled into some sort of legal, uh, illegal activity or criminal activity. So we do have some sort of downside protection to that end. But I have to admit, uh, even though the terms are available, the enforcement and the execution of these terms are still questionable. We have been fortunate uh, to have not had to exercise such terms over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we do have some downside protection, but the ability to execute those, 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 uh, those terms in the case uh, that the sponsor has been uh, accused of a crime is, is still questionable. Got it. Th thanks, Andy. Um, a question came in about the valuation metrics of the underlying portfolio, such so the PE, PBs, Khan, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's, it's really simple. As we said earlier that 70% um, of the portfolio is in listed equities. So that's a mark-to-market. And the balance is in private equity. And that private equity uh, portfolio is valued twice a year independently with external auditors and independent valuers. What we have seen in the past two years, particularly when Andy mentioned when the, um, the liquidity crunch um, and the investigations into some of these real estate, uh, private real estate companies were happening, um, we felt that it was prudent, and our board felt it was prudent for us to look at the valuations. And so we have seen a little bit of volatility um, in the uh, valuations of the private equity portfolio. But I think in this current world that we're operating in, um, investment companies in the UK, for example, um, seeing a much more real-time valuation on the liquid portfolios and the private equity portfolio is actually uh, something that uh, we, we believe investors would appreciate. And so, um, again, that's an area that um, you know, evaluation is done entirely independently of us. Got it, got it. Um, maybe we take a question. No, I think, um, Andy, we, we tangential to um, that question around um, uh, what's going on with, with politics, we have a question here. 
Can you talk about the politics of Vietnam? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Vietnam is a, a single party uh, system. Yeah. And uh, it's the, been, the party's been around uh, for a very, very long time. It's been uh, quite consistent in terms of its policy. Uh, its policy is really to encourage foreign investments uh, into Vietnam, as well as uh, recycling and reinvestments of profits into Vietnamese businesses. So in other words, if you're a Vietnamese business, you do well, there, there's a higher encouragement to reinvest back into your businesses in terms of uh, in, uh, expanding your capacity, uh, etc. Uh, in terms of the politics, um, yes, there will be changes in the leadership. There will be investigations for folks that have broken laws. But I think in general, uh, Vietnam has proven that over the years, the policy remains very, very consistent. And that is to, like I said, that is to encourage foreign indirect investment as well as foreign direct investments. And, and we've seen, you know, the foreign direct investments really continue and grow. Um, so, yes, th that th if you do the bad thing, you're going to get in trouble. But um, I think investors, institutional investors, foreign investors appreciate that we're heading in that right direction. Um, and for us, the important element is the FDI continues with strength. Last year, I believe um, FDI disbursements was about 24 billion US dollars. Uh, commitments was, was somewhat higher than that um, at about 36 billion dollars. Um, but this first quarter, we again have seen an increase um, in, in FDI relative to even last year. Um, more important, Andy, I think is, um, you mentioned Tim Cook uh, came to Vietnam recently. I think it sort of begs the wider question here. You know, it's not just Tim Cook, Jensen Huang, when NVIDIA has come here. Um, we get a lot of uh, questions around what's happening in the technology space, the AI, the semiconductor space, and how is Vietnam potentially benefiting from that? Yeah. Well, I think the, 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 the interest in Vietnam is, is clearly to tap upon the engineering resources that, uh, that's being trained uh, from, from, from Vietnam. Obviously, we don't have enough graduates as, as China does, and, and, and there's, a, there's a sense that um, the people are applying the China plus one strategy when it comes to Vietnam. And so it's not really just about manufacturing. It's also about sourcing uh, really talented uh, uh, engineers and we are graduating a lot of uh, electrical engineers and software engineers and computer science engineers so i think these technology companies are seeing that maybe it's a it, it's an opportunity to tap in uh, uh, engineers at a lower cost and as a result we're seeing a lot of technology companies um, you know migrate to vietnam and and, and develop uh, artificial intelligence software hardware uh, and manufacturing hardware for phones and computers and, and television as well uh, I think there are two questions that came in that are somewhat linked. Uh, one is about the discount management, and two about the about the um, dividend policy. Maybe you can. Sure. Um, so, so uh, the round dividend policy, um, and really, it sort of falls under this umbrella of that return of capital to investors. Um, our fund is quite unique in that uh, we're the only Vietnam-focused fund that currently pays out a dividend. We've actually been paying out a dividend to investors since 2017. And that dividend policy is essentially 2% of NAV that is paid out uh, per annum. Uh, it's about 2.4% of, of, uh, of yield based upon the share price. And it gets paid out semi-annually. So every six months, investors get a, a check from the company. That, in, that dividend is paid out of income. The other return of capital um, that's been gone, going on since 2011 has been a buyback policy. And the fund has, since 2011, spent uh, over 480 million US dollars returning capital uh, to shareholders in the forms of buyback. And where, where the discount is today, linking that second question around discount, the discount today has averaged a little, somewhat wider than we expected and we, we, we are comfortable with. You know, it is creeping around a 20 plus or minus mark, percent mark. Um, historically, uh, that dividend, if you look over the last five years, has been much narrower, uh, around about the 15% or so mark. So as that discount's widened, you see a lot more activity in the buybacks. Um, the uh, past uh, 12 months, uh, for example, we've spent about $45 million in buybacks. And if you think about the $20 million that we've paid out uh, to investors uh, in dividends, um, that return of capital uh, represents about 4 to 5% to shareholders. We can also uh, say that um, we're spending a lot of time marketing the fund uh, around the world, in Europe, in the US uh, as well. 
and and to be honest, our NAV has gone up uh, a bit faster uh, than uh, than um, investors uh, purchasing the shares. As a result, the discount has widened, and so we we continue to focus on investing in good companies, and the NAV continues to uh, to grow. And so we'll have to market the fund and its performance to shareholders to get them interested, so that demand can keep up with the uh, the increase of uh, NAV. Um, maybe we have uh, time for one last question. Uh, there's a question about the private equity valuations. It's 20%, around 20% of the portfolio. So uh, the question is around how are investors uh, assured of accuracy of, of the valuations? Yeah, that's quite simple. We, we, we do track um, the value of the exits at the time of exit against the NAV. The NAV of private equity uh, assets, are, uh, the, the value of the private equity asset is reviewed every uh, six months. Uh, by uh, independent committee of the board of directors. And so they review it and they opine and they accept the value of the private equity holding. We compare that from time to time at exit, uh, especially uh, to the exit value. And historically, we've been uh, at or above that level, uh, I would say nine out of 10 times. And upon IPO as well. And so we've been able to track uh, the ability to exit through an IPO or trade sale at values at or above the, uh, the, the, uh, the value of the NAV of the asset. Got it. Thank you. Um, Perfect. Uh, Andy, Khan, Tom, I might just jump in there and thank you for answering those questions from investors. Of course, the company can review all the questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which is particularly important to you all at the company. Andy, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, uh, I, I uh, <laughs> had a closing comment earlier, but uh, we'll have uh, again. But uh, we, we are in a market that is uh, quite volatile. Uh, the volatility affords us the opportunity to find uh, uh, investments with uh, strong returns. Uh, we are looking to invest in businesses that de uh, de deliver to us 15 to 25% IR return per annum. And we hope that over the next five to 10 years, we continue to outperform the VN index. That's clearly another option for global investors to participate in Vietnam is through the VN index. But our private equity strategy in terms of selecting and doing due diligence and having downside protections in some of these businesses and helping them grow over the next three, five, and seven years uh, will, will be able to demonstrate that the return is, is, is far uh, outstanding against the, uh, the VN index over the next uh, five to 10 years. So we hope that global investors will participate along with us uh, in terms of investing in these types of uh, businesses in Vietnam. Perfect. Andy, Khan, Tom, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete which I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Vina Capital Vietnam Opportunity Fund, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.